Do you want me to call you Robbie or Robert in this? I go by Robbie. I don't really, I don't like the name Robert. My mom would call me that when I was in trouble. <laughs> Welcome to Threshold. I'm Amy Martin, and this is Robbie Magnin. Is that a coyote out there? Can you see that? Yeah. <laughs> Robbie is the director of the Fort Peck Tribe's Fish and Wildlife Department. He was born here on the Fort Peck Reservation, which is way up in the northeast corner of Montana. How far are we from Canada now? Well, we got off, it's 26 miles. Oh, we're that close. Yeah. Wow. Life is not easy on the Fort Peck Reservation. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 41% of people who identify as Native American here had incomes that fell below the poverty line last year, almost three times the poverty rate of Montana as a whole. And life expectancy for Native Americans across the state is 19 years shorter than for whites. That's from a report by the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. You can find these kinds of statistics on many reservations, but these numbers don't begin to tell the whole story because there are thousands of Native American people working hard to bring health and prosperity to their communities. People with ideas and energy and optimism. People like Robbie Magnin. Buffalo's always been part of our economy, and it can be part of our economy again. Do you feel hopeful for the buffalo? I do, especially when the federal government turned around and finally days them on national mammal. That's the best thing that could ever happen. It reassured me that people do care. And when you get just a few people, it's going to build and build. It's going to be great. In episode two of this first season of Threshold, We talked about how the destruction of bison was at least in part an intentional strategy used to weaken native people. And it worked, at least for a while. But Robbie says the reverse is also true, and that now it's time for tribes to restore bison as a way of rebuilding their strength. Our Indian name is Tutanka Oyate, buffalo people. Can you say that again? Tutanka Oyate. Huh. And we, we follow the ways of the buffalo, we're the buffalo people. Hmm. And again, we learned our, our, our structure of our life is based on, say, what the buffalo do. Hmm. So if you don't have them, it's like you're not just missing a food source and everything else, it's like you're missing this major teacher. Exactly. And this isn't just theoretical for Robbie. Here in this very remote part of the country, he's helping the Fort Peck tribes innovate. They've already restored bison to their reservation and they have all sorts of plans for expansion. One of those plans promises to virtually eliminate the Yellowstone bison conflicts, but it's being blocked from moving forward. We're gonna dig into that issue in the second half of this episode, but I wanna start by getting a sense of how the world looks through Robbie's eyes. What does it mean to him to follow the ways of the buffalo today? Buffalo has taken care of Native Americans since the beginning of the time. And now the buffalo need help. So as a Native American, I feel it's our responsibility that we put a hand to help them, to pay back the favor. We're talking about bison conservation in a modern context. It's all about the future. Our children are like buffalo born behind a fence. They don't know the extent of our Aboriginal territory. Federal government won't do their part by standing up and doing what they need to do. It's up to us to say, okay, well, how are we gonna do this? If we actually let science guide big pieces of this, that'll help. There are some really reasonable next steps to take, but at this point, we're just speculating. We don't know what's gonna happen because we've never tried. Robbie Magnin is a big guy, 62 years old, with a long salt and pepper braid trailing out of the back of his farmer's cap. I met him in Poplar, a town of around 900 people on the edge of the Fort Peck Reservation. The Missouri River winds its way east toward North Dakota, just outside of town, and Highway 2, also known as the High Line, runs right through it. The Fort Peck Reservation is huge, more than 2 million acres of high, rolling prairie, so Robbie and I have a lot of time to talk as he takes me up to see his bison herd. Four big tribes is the home of the Cinnaboyne and Sioux people. This is originally a Cinnaboyne country. And after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Cinnaboyne and his band come up here, taken off back to Canada in some state here. Sioux is kind of an umbrella term that covers several tribes and many bands. So Fort Peck became one home for a portion of the Sioux. And Robbie says most tribal members at Fort Peck are now a mixture of Sioux and Assiniboine. The two groups speak a related language, and there's been a lot of intermarriage. The Sioux call the Assiniboine stone cookers because what they do is they get a high and dig a hole in the ground 
and put that hide there, put your meat and turnips and stuff in there, and they'll heat rocks, and they'll put one rock at a time in there and cook it slowly. The time you got to your seventh rock, your, your soup was done. Huh. And that's what that, how the soup's called in there, the, the stone cookers. Robbie's one of those fascinating kinds of people who doesn't fit into any neat categories. He's served in the military, he's worked as a police officer, and he's also a natural historian. As you'll hear, he's full of interesting information about bison and this landscape. And he has strong entrepreneurial instincts too. And woven throughout all of this is his knowledge of tribal history and culture. His connection to those roots is strong now, but he says it wasn't always this way. When we was growing up, in boarding schools, no one wanted to be Indian. Everybody wanted to be the cowboy. Uh, because the Indian was always the bad guy. You were sent to a boarding school? Yeah. Really? I, went, I was went to boarding school in South Dakota. Well, how old were you when you got sent there? I was 12 years old. Beginning in the late 1800s, Native American children were frequently separated from their families, sometimes by force, and enrolled in boarding schools with the intention of cutting them off from their indigenous cultures. Lots of people have painful memories of being taught to feel ashamed of their heritage at these schools. Indians were forbidden to speak their language to where uh, the government tried to wipe out the Indian and save the man, but it just doesn't work. And now the last 20, 30 years, people are just now becoming proud of who they are. And Robbie says bison are a key part of that process. So when you grew up, were there any buffalo here? I was almost 14 years old when I was in Denver, Colorado at the zoo. That's when I seen my first buffalo. That's kind of crazy thinking about it. You grew up here and like this is absolutely prime buffalo habitat and you're Native American and you didn't see a buffalo till you were 14 and it was in a zoo in a big city. <laughs> That's quite, quite an odd experience. But, uh, yeah, how did that feel when you were a little 14 year old guy? It, it didn't really affect me because I didn't really know our culture that much because it's taboo before it, our parents were even told, you know, you don't talk about that, you know. Hmm. The government prohibited the kid children were taken away and sent to board school so you forget about your culture. And I still have a lot of misgivings the way we teach our kids in school now because a lot of things have happened in history that we don't talk about. And I think you, our, our history needs to be told the real way. It was, it was the federal government massacred them because they figured out that was the only way to bring the Indians down to their knees. It was destroy their economy. And that's why they were almost wiped out. And people need to let people know that's the real reason. You know, yeah. it's history that's been done. We can forgive. But to deny the truth, see, this guy can play king of the rules, man. Robbie cut himself off there because we've just come upon our first bison of the day. And what he said was, this guy's going to play king of the road. It's a huge bull hanging out by himself, looking relatively unimpressed by the fact that Robbie's truck is rolling right toward him. He is big. How much do you think he weighs? About 2,300 pounds. Wow. <laughs> we keep winding up through the hills of the reservation, and the road goes from gravel to dirt to no road at all. It's just lush green prairie in all directions, as far as the eye can see. It's so pretty up here. All this rain made everything nice and green. Yeah. Robbie says the Fort Peck tribes first reintroduced bison in the year 2000. And they were reintroduced after 139 year absence from this reservation. He was part of that project and he's been leading it ever since. They've gone from 100 bison to more than 500 today. With the tribes reintroducing buffalo, since buffalo played a very important role in Native American culture, a lot of our traditional ceremonies are coming back since they've been here. And it's rejuvenated a lot of things on this reservation since they've been back. A whole bunch of bulls, I mean. Oh, yeah, all speckled around. As we're watching, one of the bulls flips its enormous body upside down and rolls back and forth, kicking up a cloud of dust. It's called wallowing. I have ranchers saying, well, they destroy the ground when they wallow on the ground. What they're doing is when it rains, it creates little water pockets for your smaller birds to have water. Robbie says these wallows the buffalo make have helped to bring back a small songbird to the reservation, the Sprague's Pippet, which is listed as threatened with extinction in Canada and vulnerable in the United States. What was the name of that bird again, Sprague's Pippet? Sprague's Pippet, yep. It's a grayish bird. We got a lot of them and then um, one's that curved curlew. 
it's kind of crazy to draw deep snow here. You can see the buffalo, they use their big head to move all that snow. And they'll graze some and they'll move on. But if you watch where they already walked away, deer populations come and they, the snow's cleared off from them and they'll eat the grasses. Oh. And if you still watch it, bird populations that stay here year round, they're getting the gravel off the ground that the buffalo cleared. Huh. So what the buffalo's doing is creating more food for other species. And uh, again, Mother Nature's best tool is the buffalo. It helps all other wildlife. And Robbie says the buffalo are doing a lot to help the people, too. When we brought the buffalo back, everybody started talking to the buffalo. Mm. And just that started bringing our people up pride again. And now our community calls even call themselves now the Fort Peck Tribes Buffalo Chasers. Oh, nice. So is that a tribal college? Yeah. Uh-huh. It, is, it is brought everything out just positive around here. Robbie often takes school groups on tours to see the bison, and in the fall of 2015, they had their first buffalo summit. It was a week summit, and we put a 15, I know it's 20 teepees we put out up here, and each teepee had a different little classroom on buffalo history, the cultural uses, traditional uses, the, how they, they use the habitat. Close to 1,500 kids from schools on and off the reservation ended up taking part in the summit. And these educational programs are just one part of how the Fort Peck tribes are using buffalo to create new opportunities. They've divided their animals into two herds, a cultural herd and a business herd. The cultural herd is the bigger of the two with more than 350 animals. The business herd has around 180 animals. And every year they issue around 25 hunting permits to non-tribal members for this herd. I've had hunters from Australia, South Korea, Germany, a lot of people in the eastern states. Last time, we talked about the bison hunt happening on the borders of Yellowstone, which would be hard to describe as fair chase. Robbie says the hunt is different here. Because the buffalo run, basically in our business herd, we run it on 13,000 acres. And when you hunt, you got to actually stock them. And if people can learn there very quick, it's not that easy. If they see you, boom, they're gone. Permits to hunt at Fort Peck range in price from $1,000 all the way up to $10,000 a piece. And there's so much demand for them that the tribe has to have a drawing to select the winners. And Robbie has other ideas beyond the hunt, too. He wants to build some cabins up here, which he could rent out to hikers and hunters and educational groups. And then there's carbon credits. Much of the buffalo pasture here is native prairie. It's never been plowed. And Robbie says some companies have expressed interest in paying the tribes to keep it this way, to compensate for their carbon emissions. So there's all kinds of ways that bringing back the buffalo can make a real impact on the tribe's bottom line. You're kind of an entrepreneur, it sounds like. No, I'm a dreamer. I come up here and I think of things like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure there's a big difference between an entrepreneur and a dreamer. <laughs> And Robbie has another dream, too. It's more than a dream, really. It's a plan, a project that he's already tested and proven to be successful. And it could prevent the slaughter of hundreds of Yellowstone bison every year. Yes, it's a win-win situation. So why are some people fighting this idea? We'll have more after this short break. Welcome back to Threshold. I'm Amy Martin, and I'm with Robbie Magnan, director of the Fort Peck Tribe's Fish and Wildlife Department, driving into a 320-acre pasture surrounded by high fences. We're officially now in the Fort Peck Tribe's buffalo pasture. Like many Native Americans, Robbie is very troubled by the fact that hundreds of Yellowstone bison are being shipped to slaughter almost every year. Instead of massacring these animals when they migrate out of the park in the wintertime when they're hungry, okay, Let's get them out alive and start other cultural herds going. That's the core of Robbie's plan. Use brucellosis-free Yellowstone bison to help herds get started in other places. Instead of killing them in the springtime, bring them here and we'll, we'll test them. And after they've gone through the required times and still clean, then we'll help other state organizations, federal organizations, and tribes that want to have genetically pure buffalo from Yellowstone, we can give them. This is called a quarantine process, and I just want to do a quick clarification about that word, quarantine. It's confusing because it's used to mean two totally different things in the bison world. The first kind of quarantine is what we were talking about in our last episode. That's quarantine for cattle after they've tested positive for brucellosis. 
the quarantine that Robbie's talking about is for bison, and the idea here is keeping any bison that have been exposed to brucellosis contained, even if they've tested negative, and then monitoring them for the disease until we can be sure it's not going to develop. This is a year-long process for bulls and can take up to two and a half years for females. Any animals that test positive during that time are killed, but the majority of bison that have been exposed to brucellosis fight off the bacteria and never test positive for it. Robbie calls them the graduates. What we would do is out of the graduates, we'd give 70% to whatever organizations wanted, and we'd keep 30% for our own use. Some people have raised concerns that this plan amounts to privatizing a public resource because the animals would move from federal to tribal control. But others say that if the bison stay under federal control but get shipped to slaughter, they're not really a resource for anyone. And in Robbie's vision, the majority of the quarantined animals would eventually move on from Fort Peck to other tribes, to conservation groups, and to state and federal agencies that are hoping to establish herds elsewhere. I've got people from Henry Mountains are wanting to get some. People in the Bronx Zoo are wanting to get some. I got the Blue River Reservation wants some. The Crow tribe wants some. And I got a tribe in uh, Oklahoma, Cherokees. They all want them. These are all the genetics they're trying to get off these animals. But I can't promise anything because I don't even know if I'll get them. See? He doesn't know if he'll get them because the quarantine project appears to be trapped in some kind of political black hole, which we're now going to dive into. The National Park Service ran two pilot quarantine projects, one on one of Ted Turner's Montana ranches and one here at Fort Peck under Robbie's watch. Based on the success of those experiments, the park has stated its preference for using the Fort Peck quarantine facility as a long-term alternative to ship to slaughter. They released an environmental assessment of the plan in January of 2016, and there was even talk of it being implemented within a few months. But as we prepare this episode for broadcast, it's been more than a year, and still there's been no word, no action. This whole plan has just ground to a halt. After they found out it works, they they quit it. And why quit something you know it works? That struck me as an excellent question. Why have we quit something that works? Well, the primary argument against using the Fort Peck facility is that it would mean moving Yellowstone bison out of the designated surveillance area, the area around the park that we learned about in our last episode, where cattle producers have to do extra testing for brucellosis. The Montana Department of Livestock and the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, have both voiced this concern. But for years, some Yellowstone bison have been shipped to an APHIS research facility in Colorado. So why is it okay to move them there, but not to the Fort Peck quarantine facility? Why is APHIS opposing transfer out of the DSA when they themselves are doing it? I tried repeatedly to get an interview with Don Harriet, the APHIS representative to the Interagency Bison Management Plan, but he turned down my request. We told them, we're willing to help, we'll do anything you want, we'll sign MOUs, anything that you want, we're willing to work with you, but they still won't budge. It's a big political game that's been played at the expense of the buffalo. I'll just talk to him until he gets sick of me. <laughs> How could I ever get sick of you, Amy? Well... <laughs> <laughs> All right, time to go! <laughs> this is Montana Governor Steve Bullock. I figured if Robbie was right, and this quarantine plan is trapped in some sort of political game, maybe one of our leading politicians could help clarify what's going on here. I interviewed him in August of 2016, and he was in the middle of his re-election campaign at the time. We started by talking about Montana's role in bison conservation overall. Montana's pretty special in the amount of potential bison habitat we have and in the number of different um, communities that are working on it in one way or another. And it makes me wonder if we are emerging or we could be a national leader for the restoration of this species, not just, you know, a conservation herd of 100 here and 200 there, but an actual ecological scale restoration herd. And do you get that sense that we could be or should be uh, playing that role for this species for the country? Or? Well, I think we move in steps. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, whether ultimately that is a step that happens years from now or when, I don't know, to to be candid. You know, it's not without some challenges. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to get at, though, is do you have a vision for that one way or the other? 
are you just wanting someone else to lead, then you're just going to be more following on this issue? Well, Amy, I think that in many ways, certainly around Yellowstone, it is a challenging, challenging issue with competing certain interests. But that's where then, I mean, where I will lead is both with science inclusiveness. I asked the governor if he felt like using the quarantine facility at Fort Peck might be a way forward through those challenges. Avis has objected to mm. that. and But where are you at on it? Are you wanting it to go forward or not? I want to figure out ways that we can do something other than take bison to slaughter. But we also were moving potentially infected bison out of the designated surveillance area. I mean, that makes significant costs incumbent, not just on the state, but also on private ranchers and others around there. So, Would it, though? The, I mean, if, they, if, if that quarantine facility is all approved and, I mean, I went out and looked. Have you been there? I've not been there yet. Yeah, I mean, the, it's got like fences upon fences to keep them contained. I mean, would it actually but, cause... But, but it's beyond, right? It's beyond the designated surveillance Yeah, area. oh yeah. So again, this is the argument for not using the Fort Peck facility. It moves bison beyond the DSA, and that is risky. But I wanted Governor Bullock to quantify that risk. How likely is it that bison held at Fort Peck would pass brucellosis on to cattle? Um, I've said, you know, there's two ways to become a wildlife biologist in Montana. One, you go and you get your degree, and then the other is you run for office. So (laughs) every office holder seems to think they're a biologist. But if we actually let science guide big pieces of this, that'll help. It would be very difficult for brucellosis to be transmitted from the bison herd at Fort Peck to any cattle in Montana. I followed Governor Bullock's advice and took my question to a wildlife biologist, Rick Wallen, the bison project leader at Yellowstone National Park, who we met in episode one. And the reason I say that is that every time a test result comes back positive, this program calls for removing that animal and killing it. But brucellosis can go undetected in bison between testing times. So what if an animal that is brucellosis positive but has not yet been removed from the herd were to escape the quarantine facility? In the five years that Robbie has run his pilot project at Fort Peck, this has never happened. But what if? What are the steps that would need to happen for the disease to spread to cattle? The animal would have to break down two fences in the quarantine facility or somehow escape those two fences. And then there's a third fence around the larger bison pasture. If it figured out how to get out of the third layer of fencing, it would have to be a female. It would have to be a pregnant female. And the female would have to either abort a pregnancy or have a full-term pregnancy. And then on top of that, It would have to occur in a place where some nearby livestock would encounter that, lick it, you know, nuzzle it with its nose, some sort of soft tissue contact for the bacteria to be transferred. So those are some pretty far-fetched scenarios. So is it impossible for bison held in quarantine to give brucellosis to neighboring cattle? No. But is it likely? Also, no. There's no path forward here without pros and cons, so just saying there's a risk isn't enough. We have to measure that risk and compare it to the potential rewards. The ability to implement a quarantine program would reduce the number of disease-free bison that are shipped to slaughter by, you know, who knows, 70 or 80 percent. We could probably find homes for most of the animals that would test negative that would have otherwise been consigned to slaughter. In a document published online in January of 2016, the National Park Service says a decision on the quarantine proposal will be made by the regional director of the Intermountain Region of the Park Service. That person is Sue Massica, and she also declined my interview requests. So here we sit, with Yellowstone bison being killed when they try to leave the park, and people all over the country who want those animals to help restore this species throughout its range. So we've got supply, and we've got demand. And in between, there's Robbie Magnin, waiting for an answer. Now look at this! We've finished our tour of the quarantine area, and Robbie's taking me to see the rest of the herd. Oh, there's a bunch of calves. We've come upon hundreds of bison, including dozens of little red calves, relaxing on the prairie in the late afternoon sun. I love to watch buffalo because 
they ask for very little and they're happy. When I have a tough day, things aren't going right, I come here and watch these guys. And after watching them, I realize how much they enjoy being out here. And he, you see these big guys, that you know, he, he enjoys it out here. You see the mothers and the babies where they're playing, fighting each other and running, and they enjoy it. And, and they say, well, my life ain't bad after all. When I come home, I feel good. Can we see if they're talking at all? Awesome. That is so going on my show. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, look at those guys. How has it changed you working with Buffalo? I feel they made me a lot better person. I used to be kind of a real antsy person, and I've learned to settle down, calm down. Is I don't rush things anymore. Things are a lot better. My kids grew up around them. They ever since they were four or five years old, I come up here on weekends and bring them with them and show them. It's fun to watch their eyes when they first see them. You can see some kids say, there's Buffalo. Their eyes get this big, Buffalo! Everybody really starts to look. <laughs> How many kids do you have? I got four. Actually, I got a nephew and niece now that their dad died. We, we take care of them, and I bring them up here. Come up, watch these guys. It's really good therapy. See, like this little one here, she sticks with her mother. Her mother and daughter. Yeah. When it was early spring, when they first started calving, they'll run all circles of calves. They're protecting them. And that's how they evolved since the beginning, is they learn how to protect their young. We gotta teach the children not to be ashamed to be Native American. Fort Peck tribes aren't the only Native Americans working to reconnect themselves to bison. And they're not the only tribes facing opposition in that either. Why wouldn't you have the original stewards of the bison um, come back and manage the bison for the American public? This is Rich Jansen of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. We'll hear more from him next time on Threshold. This episode was sponsored by Hurrah Lip Balms, that's Hurrah with a W, and by Montana Public Radio, and also by listeners like you. Threshold is produced by me, Amy Martin, with help from Nick Mott, Zoe Rome, Jackson Barnett, Nora Sachs, and Josh Burnham. Special thanks this week to Beth Ann Austin. Music by Travis Yost.